Good morning and thank you for joining us here on the Morning Medical Update. I'm Jessica Lovell. It is summer and just like many of you, we are working hard to bring you some fun and exciting shows come fall. This morning we are bringing you a rebroadcast of one of our favorite shows. If you have any questions, please leave them below. We will answer them during our live broadcasts on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. So sit back and enjoy this best of morning medical update. It's Wednesday, April the 20th, and this is Open Mics with me, Dr. Stephen Stites, the Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Thanks for joining us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Imagine not being able to hold a knife or fork to eat. Or do a simple thing like writing a note or signing a check. It's a reality for a lot of people. And now those suffering from essential tremor of the hands or Parkinson's have a new treatment allowing them to do the things they love once again. Get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. Find links right, th right here on those to, uh, for our, on our screen. I can't talk this morning. Essential tremor is a neurological disorder affecting your hands, head, and even your voice. The University of Kansas Health System is closing in on the 100th patient for a non-invasive treatment approved by the FDA last year. Jill Chadwick joins us now from Studio B with more on that. That Jill. Good morning, Dr. Stites. It's the oldies Good but morning. goodies today. You and it me. is. You're back I in the saddle. How's it feel back there? It feels good. I'm the backup to the backup. Well, you know, some <laughs> days we've got to call in the cavalry. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so this is so exciting. We were invited into the procedure room when the first three patients received this novel treatment called Exablate Neuro. Previously, patients had to undergo holes drilled into their head for treatment. But this procedure is an ultrasound wave. The before and after what these three patients were going to share with you is a wow. Bob Hallinan has our story. Don Heaney has a tough time holding a knife and a fork. Right now, I almost need a scoop shovel to eat with. Judith Eames had to quit writing to her friends. I haven't been able to do Christmas cards, birthday cards, thank you notes, anything like that. And Rich Schaefer just wants to be able to get dressed quicker. It takes me about 10 minutes to button my shirt. All three have something in common. Each has a neurological disorder called essential tremor, uncontrollable muscle movements, usually in the hands. And they are the first three patients at the University of Kansas Health System to undergo a new treatment for these tremors called Exablate Neuro. The traditional treatment for essential tremor was deep brain stimulation, which involved drilling a couple of holes into a patient's head and implanting a device to stimulate targeted regions of the brain with electrical impulses from a battery-operated neurostimulator. We're gonna run this one, we're gonna do one more. This new procedure applies focused ultrasound precisely to the spot in the brain causing the hand tremors. It destroys this tissue without risk or damage to the surrounding healthy tissue. The best part, no surgical incisions are needed, the patient is awake the whole time and usually goes home the same day. Before the procedure, each patient was asked to trace a few things on a piece of paper and write their names. As you can see, their writing is barely legible because of the tremors. Now, look at this amazing transformation after the procedure. The tremors have all but disappeared and all three were able to write their names so that everyone could read it. Judith was so excited, she couldn't wait to write thank you notes to her medical team. It feels just like it did before, but I still have to work on the writing. Whoa, a lot. <laughs> Rich saw a huge difference holding a cup without shaking for the first time in years. It's not vibrating or anything. And Don, for the first time in decades, was able to eat pudding with a spoon. All things that most of us take for granted. <laughs> that just makes me smile every time I see that. And think of this, with COVID, people with essential tremor found simple tasks like washing their hands and putting on a face mask challenging 
prior to their exablate neuro procedure. Another thing I didn't know, but I'm sure you docs will discuss, is the statistic that essential tremor is inherited 45 to 90% of the time. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Dr. Seitz? Hey, this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. Those pictures are great. Actually, I have a couple of patients I'm going to be referring to our experts here. <laughs> I just, you know, I'm learning about this, this procedure as we just visited. And I think its full name is MRI Guided Ultrasound Ablation. Is that about right? Did I kind of get it close? Yeah. It's focused ultrasound. Well, focused ultrasound. There you go. And uh, the, the product name is Xplate. So we're going to turn to our guest now. Joining us um, with how the Xplate Neuro works is Dr. Jennifer Chang, a neurosurgeon here at the health system, and Dr. Rajesh. Good Lord. How long have I known you? Just About 30, 30 years. 30, 30, 30 years we've known each other. Uh, Dr. Pawa, a neuro, neurologist and director of the Parkinsonian Disease and Movement Disorder Program here. Also joining us via Zoom is Shirley Thurber Godbold. Is that close? A patient who has That's received, not, not bad for an old guy, received the <laughs> treatment. Shirley, let's start with you. As we heard from the other patients, this exploit treatment is really changing lives. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And in fact, I wish they'd hurry up and prove the second side so that I could have my right hand done also. I'm my dominant hand was not the problem. Therefore, I wonder with my age if a school teacher changed me from left-handed to right-handed. <laughs> but I'm back doing all the things I love. That is pretty amazing. So talk to us a little bit about when that happened. Um, what has the disorder done to the daily things you used to be able to do before you had the exploit? Uh-oh, you're on mute. Make sure you're off mute. It went okay. Um, I was ready to quit two of the things I love. I have been an um, English handbell ringer for um, since I was 10. We won't tell how old I am. Um, and I was going to have to quit that because the tremor caused the fact that the bell might ring when it shouldn't because it shook. And also, I um, do a lot of sewing, and I was going to have to stop that. And I have two wonderful grandchildren I love to sew for. So I'm back doing those things. I can eat things like coleslaw and rice without having to ask, would they please bring me a spoon? And those wow. are things you don't realize. You know, those sacrifices we give up, those modifications we make in our life as we get older, do take a little bit of the joy away. And so when there's especially things like you just mentioned, handbell ringing, I can imagine that will be really difficult. I was in a handbell choir. I don't think they really liked me very well. Um, but uh, the, something like what you've just described is remarkable in sewing. What a great hobby and then not being able to do that. So you have the exploit therapy. Tell us a little bit about how that was and, and then the results. It, it was great. Um, I was aware that there were going to be some side effects to begin with, and they have gone away. Um, your balance is off a little bit. Um, you lose your taste in your mouth. And of course, when I say I can't taste that, everybody's going, oh, no, do you have COVID? Well, no, I don't. But now that's gone away. Um, so I'm back to doing the normal things I did every day that I couldn't do before. And you know, my mother had this and I started having it at about age 16 to 18. So I put up with it for a lot of years. My family wanted me to do it years ago and I didn't want to shave my head. Well, there was a blessing. I now have thicker hair and I have a little bit of wave I never had before. So does that mean you think if I shave my head, I might get thicker hair back? I'm going to You'll try that. You'll have to ask the specialist on that. <laughs> hey, I'll check that. Maybe I need a little ultrasound up there. It'll help me grow my hair back. That'd be <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we probably have some people who have questions in this treatment. Let's talk to our physicians here. Dr. Chang, explain to us what Exploit is, how the treatment works. Kind of go through this a little bit for us. Okay, sure. Um, so Exoblate is the commercial name of the MRI-guided focused ultrasound technology that we use. Um, so... What it is, um, is a treatment where a patient will um, have their head secured in a frame and they will be laying down on the MRI table and there is a ultrasound helmet that goes over their head. Um, with this helmet, there's 1,024 individually controlled ultrasound waves that will be aimed towards the target deep within the brain in the thalamus. Um, and it allows us to very precisely heat the portion of the brain just enough to cause a permanent lesion that will treat the tremor. 
So it's a very exciting, minimally invasive technique, which allows us to treat the brain without cutting, you know, making any incisions and without drilling a hole in the skull. So the worst thing you have to do is shave your head so the no ultrasound works yes, correctly? It, okay. Yes, we do have to shave the head. For some of us, that's not as big a loss as for <laughs> others. So, so, yeah. so it's, how successful is it? Like what percent of people get this really great response that this patient uh, that, uh, that Shirley has had? It's highly successful. Um, on average, tremor scores are reduced by 70%. Okay. Um, and um, it is a very highly successful treatment. How long does it take to do? Uh, altogether, the treatment takes about three hours. But okay. we're not doing the actual sonication the entire time. The sonication is done in very brief, you know, short bursts at 10 to 20 seconds at a time. Now, there, we use this mouthful, MRI-guided, ultrasound-directed. So what does that all mean? How does that work together? Tell us how you put all that together. Okay. So the procedure is actually done in our intraoperative MRI scanner in Cambridge at KU. Um, and the MRI-guided part of it is that while we're doing the sonication, while we're delivering the ultrasound energy to the brain, we are running the MRI at the same time. And that allows us to, on our computer, look at the temperature in the brain tissue. So we're looking at that very small spot in the brain and making sure the temperature gets high enough to do what we want it to do. That's pretty cool. And there's, <laughs> no, and there's no staples and there's no, there's no sutures and all that? Nope. No oh, that's impressive. No and, and man, that's, got, that's come a really long way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Can you do that with tumors or other things? Or So actually, we are actively engaged in research to apply it to other diseases. So uh, one of those is epilepsy, um, so treating areas of the brain that are causing someone to have seizures. Um, and then there's also active research going into using it uh, to treat brain tumors and Alzheimer's disease, other Excellent. things like that. Let's get that Alzheimer's disease anything's really revved up because I'm sure that <laughs> my wife thinks, I think you're getting a little bit of it. Okay, so I'm going to turn now to, to Dr. Rajesh Pawa, um, the neurologist and the director of our movement disorders clinic. And again, he and I have worked together for 30 years here. We were comparing notes about who came first. I beat him by a year. He got on staff because my training program was just a little longer. So he's actually been on staff a year longer than I have, which that kind of made me mad. I thought I was a good guy. Um, so Dr. Pawa, talk to us about how this uh, treatment was developed. So you need to remember, ultrasound has been around for over 100 years. Uh, we found out early that ultrasound waves cause heat. Uh, and initially, of course, 100 years ago, it was used in animals to destroy tissue and tumors. So this has evolved over the years. And how it has come down to helping essential tremor is that more than 50, 60 years ago, we were doing thalamotomies for essential tremor. With thalamotomies, we had to drill a hole put a probe in the brain, burn the tip of the, uh, heat the tip of the probe, and burn a part of the brain. So we knew thalamotomy was very effective. From that, we developed deep brain stimulation, where instead of heating the part of the brain, we just left the electrode in the brain and turned the power on, kind of producing the same uh, lesion effect uh, without the lesion part. So when ultrasound evolved, uh, as well as MRI evolved, we were able to better visualize the brain and use ultrasound waves. The way I explain to my patients is, remember, well, not when we were kids, even now, we go out in the sun, hold a magnifying glass, put a paper underneath, and bring all the rays to one point and burn the paper. So it's similarly here, you are taking thousands of uh, ultrasound waves, bringing it to one point and creating a lesion in the brain, uh, and that's how you cause a thalamotomy and that's how you help essential tremor patients. That's a pretty big deal. So the, our patient today described a little bit of a loss of balance and a loss of test. Is that normal after this? So, of course, this treatment is evolving. You know, this is around for now, FDA approved for at least five years now. And we are learning how many lesions to create, where to create the lesions, and I'll leave that up to Dr. Chen. But in our experience, we have found that initially after the procedure, a lot of patients do have uh, balance difficulties. Majority of those improve by three months. And we believe when we start seeing more and more patients at the year, this would have completely resolved because ultimately we are causing a lesion, we are causing swelling in the brain, so we will see some balance difficulties. So what's your, is, that, is that your experience? Do people get these to resolve over time? Yes, so the majority of our patients um, at the end of a month are already starting to get better from any sort of side effects that they 
will encounter after surgery. And uh, balance is the most common side effect that people can have. Other times people can have some numbness or tingling, sometimes a little bit of difficulty with speaking. Um, but the far majority of patients don't, at the, at the, at by six months, they return to baseline. That is really remarkable. And what, I just think of all those patients who have essential tremor out there. How do you decide who gets it and who doesn't get it? So we have a discussion with our patients, um, and we do offer them the choices. So f let me just say, first of all, if the medication is not working well for the patient, that is, they're already on medication for tremor and they either can't tolerate it or the tremor's just progressed and the medication is not treating it well enough, uh, that's when we consider surgery. So then, you know, we have elective brain surgery. So we have the option of deep brain stimulation, which is, was described earlier in the segment where we place a wire, implant the wire into the brain and use electrical stimulation and you have focused ultrasound. So those are the two options. And so there's a big difference. You know, one is minimally invasive and the other one does involve putting a wire and implanting hardware in. Yeah. So we give the patient the option, you know, we say these are the different choices and then um, they decide. Is there a reason then that you would prefer somebody to do the more invasive than the non-invasive? The non so sometimes um, a patient is very interested in having tremor treated up front on both the right hand and the left hand. Mm -hmm. So that is FDA approved that we can do that with deep brain stimulation. Um, with focused ultrasound, it's currently um, in study to show that that's safe and that's effective. So we all believe that it will be approved soon to be able to treat both sides, um, but it's not FDA approved yet. Okay. I think, uh, you know, we should not say at this stage uh, that one is superior to the other. You're right. I mean, there are two procedures. Uh, they both have equal benefits. Uh, of course, when you do deep brain stimulation, you have the advantage that you're not creating a lesion, but the negatives are you have a hardware in place, you're drilling holes, there's more risk of having bleeds and all, but you can also program the device uh, to increase the stimulation if there are not enough benefits or to decrease the stimulation if you have side effects. With focus ultrasound, it's kind of a lesion that is created, the benefits and the side effects may improve over time but if the benefit of the lesion reduces over time, which we do know can happen in some patients, they may require re-lesioning. Okay. So Dr. Chen, we'd heard a little bit about the inherited nature of this. Anything you could do to predict whether somebody's going to get it or not get it? Uh, well, so let's just, so sometimes people have familial inherited essential tremor. So in that case, it's autosomal do dominant. So what that means is that if one parent has the tremor, then there's a 50% chance that any child they have will have the tremor. Um, and often, as you hear, sometimes it could be something that starts very early, fairly early in childhood, teenage years, um, but usually does not worsen until people are older, above 40. Um, and then in terms of other people who don't have a familial form, we, we just don't know why they have tremor. Okay. Well, Jill, let's see what questions we might have out there. We have other questions coming in from our community. We do, and uh, we have a couple of COVID questions, and then we have Isaac, who has a question that's kind of on the bubble. So I'm gonna get these COVID questions out of the way, and then there are more um, tremors and Parkinson's and, and lots of questions to come. So first of all, Isaac is asking, it's kind of a good question. People with essential tremors, tremor, did they have any trouble getting the COVID shot? Is it hard to give them a shot or, or treat them because they're shaking? Well, I know um, we'll see what our experts say, but I, we can give people shots one way or the other because we, we can find it. We'll find a target. We'll move, move. We can hold it. Yes. You know, usually it's the hands that are shaking, not the arms. Yeah, so, no, that's not an issue at all. Yep. You can get okay. a COVID shot. And don't forget to get your boosters. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get to Carola Wendy's questions here in a minute. But first, um, Sarah from Springfield is asking a COVID question. She said, with the mask mandate lifted on planes, can I still wear one if I want to? And where is the risk of catching COVID more, in the terminal or on the plane? Well, that's a great question. Hawkeye's here. He's yeah. joined us, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Disease and and, uh, mm -hmm. and Infection Control. So <clears throat> well, he and I are going to go yeah. take this and take this one on. Let me just say, first of all, masking is always a choice. Yeah. You are never forced to not wear a mask. That That is just, boy, that, that would be unethical, immoral, and wrong just to name a few things. Um, the, 
you can still wear a mask on a plane. And in fact, quite honestly, I'm going to still wear a mm-hmm. mask on a plane. I, I'm going to travel in June. I'm going to have my mask on. And here's why. Um, airflow on planes is really improved throughout the pandemic. We had Dr. Barkman on here uh, earlier this week, and he, he talked a lot about how the airflow has changed. You got new filters in planes. That's making it more effective. Um, and the airflow comes from the top of the plane and goes down to the floor and goes out on the floor. But the problem is you're right next to somebody, and you're right next to them for a long period of time. And even though the airflow clearly helps, I don't think it will be um, it will be of no surprise to me, uh, Hawk, that mm-hmm. um, we're going to see more outbreaks coming from planes yeah. than we have currently mm-hmm. when people are masked up. Yeah, I think that's completely right, Steve. I, w- I would agree with you. I think uh, both situations pose their own risks. Um, but I think I agree with you. You know, the airflow is better, but the proximity to other people on the plane, um, I think that just sets you up to being uh, at higher risk uh, in general. So I g- also agree with you. You know, you can wear a mask anytime. You've, you've talked about it before, lung transplant patients. We know our, our BMT patients and other patients that are uh, have immune compromise, severe immune compromise, They've been wearing masks for decades, so I think you can always wear a mask. We know it does offer you protection as well. And I think the question about the terminal and the airplane is hard to know because yeah. it really depends a lot on how close you are in proximity. If you can find a place in an air t- a terminal in which you're not sitting down right next to someone, mm-hmm. or if you're sitting next to your own family, your own pod, if you will, then that's probably safer than the plane if you're right next to someone on the plane. But in general, if you're gonna say, I'm gonna be sitting next to people in a terminal for a long period of time versus someone on the plane, the airflow in the plane's actually better because they do have the HEPA filters and, 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 the, and the turnover rate's really rapid in a plane. That turnover rate, remember, that's how fast the air exchanges in a plane. The, um, but the uh, terminal's not that fast. And, and, and so I think the greater danger, uh, Hawk, is gonna be in, in the terminal providing you, you're going to describe the same circumstance. You're going to be right next to someone just as a, you would have been on the plane. Yeah, especially if you're waiting in lines, ticket lines, TSA, if you're waiting for food. We know at, uh, particularly at MCI, Kansas City International, we know there's very few places to get food or sit down and have drinks. And a lot of those places you're waiting. So I think you're just going to be snag, stagnant in those lines or in those areas for quite some time. Um, I think it's still very good practice, individual uh, practice to put the mask on as soon as you get into that terminal. Again, I think a, a, a horrible thing would be is if you start having symptoms and get sick while on your vacation, or if you spread it to other people that may be more uh, at risk, especially if you're going to visit them and things of that nature. So I think wearing the mask inside the terminal and on the flight is probably best practice, really. Uh, it's best practice even if it's no longer required practice. Yeah. Interesting to see the Biden administration appeals the ruling that yeah. a federal judge in Central Florida <coughs> uh, um, 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 issued. You know, the next question is, do masks help protect e- us, I think, mm-hmm. Hawk, yeah. from getting the disease? I mean, mm-hmm. We know masks are primarily designed to prevent your and germs from mm-hmm. getting out into the yeah. world, but the masks also help protect us. And I think the answer to that has been yes. Yeah. And the better grade mask you do, a KN95 works better than a simple face mask, which but works better than a cloth, cloth mask. And an N95 works best. Yeah, I would agree. I think, yeah, I don't have the reference on the top, off the top of my head. But we know uh, in that article that was published, it was a randomized control trial, uh, those people that were vaccinated and masked, they still had very good protection against infection, even when they are in those situations where others around them weren't masked. So, yeah. Excellent. Jill? Yeah, Tom from Pittsburgh, he wants to know, if people ditch masks, are we going to see more long-term COVID cases? Yeah, I think the question that is really, are you going to see more COVID when people don't have masks in mass settings? And the answer to that is you're going to see more COVID. We're going to look at a heat map in just a moment after Hawk gives our numbers. But and that'll help answer this question a little bit more. But the the, the simple reality is if you don't have masks Mm -hmm. in congregate settings, whether it's a church, any indoor environment, an airplane, a terminal, you know, a restaurant, et cetera, you're going to see more COVID as disease, as transmission go, ra- ra- raises up. And we know that transmission is beginning to increase across the United States mm-hmm. again with a new Omicron wave. So, yes, you're going to see more, um, uh, more, um, uh, uh, more uh, COVID, and therefore you will see more long COVID, right? That, those mm-hmm. things are going to just travel together. All right. Any other questions right now? Are we going to, we're going to I, move on? Not now. I'm going to hold these uh, tremor mm-hmm. questions and Parkinson's. Hit me up in a minute. Excellent. Go ahead and do the numbers. You bet. Doc Hawk. Yeah, hey. 
So uh, still under 10 active infections in the health system. We know we've been in those single digits. Uh, right now, eight active infections, two in the ICU, zero on the ventilator, 14 in that recovery period. We've inched up just a little bit, Steve. We have. Um, you know, we've seen cases overall increase uh, in the nation, there's been a slight increase nationwide, especially in particular regions, i.e. Uh, the Northeast. Um, we have seen a little bit uptick in hospitalization in that area too, but I think as we get further into this, we have to understand what are those hospital practices? Are they still testing everybody? Is it for symptomatic COVID? That remains uh, a little iffy, uh, but we know as cases rise, you know, seven, 10, 12 days, 14 days later, we have to expect um, hospitalizations to rise. So we're just kind of waiting to see what the overall trend will be. And unfortunately, we need to continue to wait for that information. So I think, uh, you know, I, I, well, let's take a look at this heat map because I think it really shows the story. Um, a week ago, this map was almost entirely very light, very light color, very light yellow. And two weeks ago, it was on the same, very pale. You can see the Northeast beginning to heat up again. You can see the outbreak in Colorado. There's one down in Texas, a little bit in New Mexico, and now along the West Coast as well. So, you know, historically these have occurred in different way, different uh, ways and rates. If you'll remember um, uh, the first variant after the main, it kind of started actually the hotspot was Springfield and spread throughout the United States along interstate highways. And, and now we're seeing it up in, in New York and which is similar to what happened with Omicron initially. And now it's kind of washing, it's gonna to wash toward the center of the country. So I think we're gonna see that same story that you're seeing in New York where things are turning pretty hot in, in the Northeast and, and now beginning to emerge in the West Coast and clearly in Colorado, a little bit of Wyoming, that we're gonna start seeing it emerge here in the Midwest probably in the next uh, four weeks. We know that Johnson County had an uptick in numbers. We know we've had more employees out with COVID. Uh, we know that our numbers in the hospital are starting to tick up a little bit. It's probably, that, that could easily be random variations. So we have to watch and see what happens there. But I think we're about ready to experience another wave, unfortunately. And what we, what we have to know is that if the, 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 the vaccination still keeps us safe and masking, if you have doubt or if you're worried about your own health, also helps keep you safe. Because, you know, what we've proven over and over and over again is that the rules of infection control travel with you protect you and keep you safe all the day long and uh, they will in the next wave as well. Um, another uh, big piece of news is that Moderna is saying that trial results suggest the redesigned vaccines can better protect against variants, Hawkeye. Mm -hmm. Encouraging news, we need to see more data. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're all kind of waiting for that further data. We know that that initial data, again, done in non-human primates, just looking at antibody levels with an Omicron-specific spike, didn't really show an increase in antibody levels, but I think we have to take that with caution as well because we know, obviously, immunity is not just about antibody levels. So I think we're all excited to see this, and um, I think there is a lot of ground to cover moving forward with vaccinations regarding what is the vaccination makeup going to be? What is the vaccination schedule? Will it be a yearly thing? Will we only need three or four doses? So I think there's a lot of uh, questions that are being examined right now, and hopefully we will be getting some of those answers. Yeah, and I think this is a really important development, and I would not be surprised at all. Not, not only get either of us are mm -hmm. surprised that the, these vaccines, which are pivoted a little bit more yeah. against Delta and Omicron, are going to be more effective. I would also not be surprised that that's what the type of vaccination we end up getting in the fall. Yeah. So we'll see how that how that goes, but uh, I think it's encouraging news. Mm -hmm. The CDC, though, dropped all of the uh, all, uh, all, all nations and all yeah. other countries from its coronavirus do not travel list. I think that's basically um, kind of like uh, throwing the flag there. You know, it's mm -hmm. like we're waving white flag. It's not going to make a difference. Co coronavirus is everywhere. It's hard to imagine that it really makes a difference. And I think you and I have been kind of saying that for a while. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think if you are traveling, I would absolutely recommend you be up to date with your vaccination. But you know, we've known this has also hurt countries. Um, we know that when South Africa first identified the Omicron variant, there was a shutdown of travel there. There were issues there that hurt that country. That also hurt the uh, expansion of science and knowledge, supply chain, all that stuff. So I think this is probably a good move by CDC. I think we know now that there is global circulation of the virus and that if you are traveling, especially out of the country, you know, just understand that that circulation is there, that virus is there, you are still very much at risk. All right, so important news on the COVID front. We'll keep a very close eye on it as we always do about what yeah. that means for our area. 
And especially if we start seeing a rise in hospitalizations that threaten our ability to take care of patients with all diseases, as we experienced in the Delta and the Omicron wave previously. Hopefully, that higher rates of vaccine and some natural immunity from prior uh, infection, especially from Omicron, are going to help protect us against the VA2 subvariant. But time will tell that. Uh, We know that in England and in Europe, where they've had a very large wave of the VA2 subvariant, Um, They did see somewhat of a rise in hospitalizations, and and we'll just have to see how that goes. And I would say, too, Steve, we've also uh, been proponents of the outpatient therapy. If you think you have symptoms, please go get tested. Get that outpatient therapy, which is very efficient and effective at reducing your risk of hospitalization as well. You know, Paxlovid obviously is on the top tier. We do have those monoclonal antibodies. We have some other things in the lower tiers as well, but hopefully the supply of Paxlovid right now uh, will continue to increase. People can get that. It's readily available. And also we continue, uh, you know, we know that there continues to be great activity of that antiviral against SARS-CoV-2 as well. Really, that is so important. Okay, yeah. we're going to pivot in a moment yeah. just back to our exoblate therapy, but Jill? Yeah, one real quick question. Brandon, Please. who's on YouTube, has got a COVID question. He says that I'm on day six of being COVID positive mm-hmm. and my symptoms have cleared up completely. Mm-hmm. I also tested negative on two rapid tests. Am I mm-hmm. safe to end my isolation today? Day six, no well, good symptoms. Good question. Hawk, what do you think? Yeah, so after testing positive, we would recommend you don't test again. I don't think there is a need for that. And as far as the um, most, the latest isolation guidance, I believe it's five days, five isn't days it? And then wearing a mask for, for the rest of that days. five days yep. to complete a total of 10 days. So. You know, you really should be good. And again, the best evidence that we have is that if it is, you know, eight to 10 days to when your symptoms started, you really shouldn't be shedding uh, virus in that infectious uh, doses or or very, uh, or even spreading active infectious virus after that eight to 10 days. So you should be safe. You would be in line with the isolation and quarantine guidance, but I would still suggest if you do have to go out to be wearing that mask and, and do that. I think that's extremely yeah, important. Like five days isolation, then five days yeah. of making sure if you go out, you mask, and that helps keep everybody else around you safe. Mm-hmm. So, All right, well, let's get back to our discussion on exoblate uh, uh, therapy. I'm here with Dr. Jennifer Chang, a neurosurgeon here at our health system. Again, welcome. And uh, Dr. Pawa, a neurologist and director of the Movement Disorder Clinic. Uh, also joining us via Zoom is Shirley Thurber Godbold. I said it right, a patient who received the therapy. Shirley. What would you say to anyone who may be on the fence about getting this new therapy? What do you think? Are there, are there well, reasons I, to do it? I Please. want to share something with you. The night before surgery, uh, my husband and I were in the hotel having um, dinner and um, with my left hand. Now I'm using my right here so you can see I still have the tremor. So this is why I'm waiting for the FDA to approve it and so I can come back and see Dr. Um, Jennifer. But here's my left hand. Look so at that I would difference. say to you, please don't put it off. My family has said to me, I don't know how many times, you know, if your mother could have done this because she got to the point she couldn't sign checks or anything, she'd have done it in a heartbeat. I put it off three years because I'll be darned if I was going to have my hair head shaved. Well, don't <laughs> put it off. Have it done. It's worth everything. It's made a huge difference in my life. I no longer have people looking at me strange when we're out to eat, or I no longer have to have my husband cut my meat so that it doesn't, everything doesn't end up in the middle of the table because I can't control my hands. So don't put it off, go have it done. That's, that is great advice. And what a great example and a great testimonial. That that was great. So Dr. Cheng, that's gotta encourage you, right? (laughs) That's gotta give you a little bit of a high there. Yeah, it's, it's very rewarding. Um, treating people who have essential tremor, Parkinson's disease, um, it's a very rewarding profession because you can see that people's quality of life improves. That is just remarkable. So what's the cost like and does insurance cover this? So it is an FDA approved treatment and is covered by insurance uh, for the most part. It is also covered by Medicare. Um, it's going to be overall for the hospital system is going to be cheaper than deep brain stimulation because we're not implanting hardware um, but yeah it's a covered that's treatment. a big deal that's a really big deal so okay is there any reason in the covid crisis that you should wait or do it or if you i mean how does COVID affect this whole story i think that it's a nice uh, option 
with COVID being around because it's minimally invasive. Um, someone's not under general anesthesia. Someone's not admitted to the hospital. It kind of decreases the exposure risk of the patient getting the treatment. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, we shut down our, all of our surgeries and procedures at the beginning oh, of the no, pandemic. Um, and I don't think we're going to do that again. Oh, God, no. But Let's I think, <laughs> you know, even if we had to draw back, this procedure yeah. we would still do. We yeah. would still offer. That's a good thing. So, Dr. Pawa, in movement disorders, has COVID had an impact on those with movement disorders? Well, some of the movement disorder, yes. Uh, like Parkinson's disease, uh, you know, patients being home all the time, not being active, uh, both it has affected them psychologically as well as physically. When we talk about essential tremor, where you are really looking at a quality of life thing, where it's the shaking, it's no different for them than you and me. So in some cases, yes, but most of essential tremor patients, no. That's a, I mean, I, you look at, at, at COVID, and you know it has such an impact with brain fog, et cetera. The people who have brain fog, does that aggravate their, their movement, underlying movement issues? So any kind of illness, uh, you know, whether it's brain fog, whether it's just getting COVID, whether it's just having a head cold, all of those can worsen movement disorders. And it can also be just having stress. You know, day-to-day -day stress can also affect it. So yes, all these things can make symptoms worse. Yeah, I think that's really important information. And just one more reason to make sure we treat COVID right. You know, get vaccinated, wear your mask, do the things you know that are going to keep you safe. Okay, so how is this treatment developed? I mean, who, who came up with this idea, guys? I mean, who, who thought about, I'm going to use an mm -hmm. ultrasound wave to try and wipe out a tremor? Uh, you know, first of all, we know thalamotomies work for essential tremor. We have been doing those for over 50 years. It was the ultrasound which produces heat was initially used for tumors because they are large objects. Uh, you know, you cannot damage the tissue around it. But trying to get to this little point in the brain, in the thalamus, was trying to get the right software, getting the MRI, finding where the VIM is so that you can actually get all the ultrasound waves in one little spot, and that's been the big change. You know, so I've tried to be the Patrick Mahomes of fly fishing. Not really people, I'm nowhere near that good. But, you know, injured my elbow a little bit. They did ultrasound therapy in my arm and my shoulder. It warms up the tissue. It makes it feel really good. Same kind of thing? Same kind of thing, except 1,000 points from that. Okay. All right. So real narrow focus and pretty darn hot. And all of them coming right down to a little point in the brain. That is just, that's just cool. Okay. So Dr. Chang, how long does this treatment last once somebody's had it? So uh, there are some rare cases where tremor kind of comes back within the first six months. And for those cases, we've been successful in offering a repeat treatment uh, to, to get a more permanent result. Uh, but in general, um, it could last for years. We really don't know. Um, tremor slowly gets worse with time, and this is not a cure for tremor. So still, you know, over a period of many years, tremor could get worse again. But it should, the treatment should improve one's quality of life now and for a number of years. So, Shirley, is yours been, how long ago did you have your treatment? Hang on. I had my treatment done August 4th of 2021. Okay, and how's it holding out so far? You're still doing great? Perfectly. You know, I was going to tell you, when my students from years ago, 50 years ago, found out I had this done, and I was explaining to them the halo and everything, the kids said, couldn't they have tightened the screws in your head a long time ago? I said, they didn't have the technology. <laughs> yeah, uh, it just, I'm not, I'm not seeing any regression. And that's why I say, as soon as they approve this other hand, I'll be back to see Dr. Jennifer. I want the other hand done also. And you awesome. saw the difference. Oh yeah, that was, that was a really cool deal with it. Was that a Coke you were trying to hold her coffee? I mean, that was, that, that was, was impressive. A Coke. It was a okay. Coke, yeah. It's kind of early in the I, morning for a Coke, isn't it? I, I'm just saying. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a coffee drinker, so. Okay, there you go. All but right. I did well, I'm with you on, about on that. purpose. Yeah. I All did right. pour it on purpose for you. <laughs> Dr. Shake, what's the one other thing folks need to know? I just think that, you know, if you're struggling with tremor uh, and, you know, you're just trying medications or just living with it, you don't have to live that way. I mean, just come to KU, get seen, and there's, uh, there's other options. There's plenty of other options, and this one is a very exciting new option. That, that is a, that's approximately a really big deal. 
Jill, what other questions are out there? Or if there's any reporter questions today? Yeah, we got a few. You've asked a lot, and it's been very helpful. But Cindy, she's in, she's really from Independence, but she says she's in Chicago today watching with her daughter. She wants to know when symptoms start with tremor, how fast do they progress? Do you just wake up one day and you're shaking, or is it a progress? Dr. Paula. So essential tremor is a disorder which starts very slowly. It can start as young as a teenager. It can start as you get older. Uh, most of the people with essential tremor start in their middle life, so to speak. The, the thing is, this is not something fast progressive such as Parkinson's. It takes years for the tremor to come. And in some patients, the tremor does not worsen over the years. So there are a lot of people out there who have had essential tremor for 20, 30 years, and it is still not impacting their life at all. On the other hand, there are patients who over five, 10 years, their tremor can get so disabling that the medication may not be helpful and they need, need something like the focused ultrasound. Okay. Tara is asking, is the focused ultrasound painful? So, during the procedure, there are some points where it can be a little uncomfortable. So number one, when we place a frame on someone's head, some people uh, find that painful. Uh, we use local um, anesthetic to numb the scalp. Um, and then when we're actually providing the ultrasound treatment to the brain, uh, in general, it is not painful, only when we have to use kind of high power uh, do sometimes people have a little bit of pain. Uh, but we provide pain medication during the procedure to help patients get through it. Um, Post-operatively, people don't experience significant pain. Is it as bad as going to the dentist? Um, different. <laughs> it's different from going to the dentist. I've, just, I've heard people say it feels, sometimes feels a little hot, a little like heating yeah. sensation. So dentist, um, that would be almost more like deep brain stimulation because we drill in the skull. Yeah, that's oh, okay. very similar to being in the dentist. But that's you're more drilling. asleep for, right? I'm taking a few drills. For, yes. For deep brain stimulation, we have someone sedated during that portion, yeah. and then we wake them up during other portions. And then um, when people are getting this done, can you do it in the outpatient clinic, in the operating room? Where do you do it? So we do it in our intraoperative MRI suite. So essentially, it's in our OR area uh, in Cambridge. Um, some hospitals have it done more at an outpatient center, yeah. um, depending on where they have it done. Okay. Jill? Okay, Wendy says, I have ET and most of my five siblings do. She said, my dad was eventually diagnosed with Parkinson's. What is the process for being evaluated? So you need to see a neurologist to assess, first of all, if a person has Parkinson's or essential tremor. Just because someone has essential tremor does not protect them from having Parkinson's. In fact, often people have essential tremor for 10, 15 years and then they may start having the Parkinson symptoms, such as slowing walking, uh, slowness in daily life, and you reassess and say, oh, you're also developing Parkinson disease. Fortunately, we do have a special scan available called the DAT scan that can actually take pictures of the brain and see if there is dopaminergic dysfunction, which would go more along with Parkinson's, and if the scan is normal, it will still mean that they do have essential tremors. Okay, so, so that was the question too on how you tell the difference between Parkinson's and essential tremor. Well, there are a lot of different ways we do. That scan, of course, is one way. But like I mentioned earlier, patients with essential tremor have the tremor for a long time. Patients with Parkinson's usually have tremor for a short period of time. Patients with essential tremor have large, untidy handwriting. Patients with Parkinson's disease have small, uh, very tiny handwriting. Patients with Parkinson's have more than tremor. They have slowness, they have stiffness, they have walking difficulty. Patients with essential tremor really purely have tremor. Then we look at what body part the tremor is. Patients with Parkinson's have more tremor in their hands, which is more what we call a resting tremor. Uh, patients with essential tremor more have it in their hands, their head, their voice. So there are also other ways to try to differentiate. And finally, the medications. Some medications work for essential tremor, some medication work for Parkinson's disease. Okay, so we have some people I think that are kind of like tuning in. So we're gonna cover real quickly just some old ground. Carol wants to know, is this a clinical trial or open to patients? Dr. Chang. It is open to patients. The, yeah, FDA approved. <laughs> okay, Debbie wants to know, what qualifies the patient for the treatment? Do you have to have a referral? This a lot to unpack here, listen. How long does it take to get in for an appointment? Does it always affect your voice? My brother and mom both had Botox injections for vocal tremor. Are these connected? 
Um, okay, so that's a lot of questions. So, um, <laughs> yeah, you, you do need a referral uh, to be referred to see a neurologist, um, and then they can then refer to the neurosurgeons, so to my group. So uh, Dr. Pawa's group is a neurologist, and typically, you know, if you have tremor, we're gonna wanna see that you've tried medications, you know? But if that doesn't, if the medications don't work, then surgery is absolutely, you know, the next step to take. Um, you, and so we do assessments, and we make sure that, you know, that we've shown that you do have disabling tremor, that you've, you know, tried medications and they're not working well enough. Uh, and then we also do a few other studies, um, like we look at a head CT, a CAT scan of the head, to see if you're a good candidate for the procedure. Um, if you have a vocal tremor, that certainly can be part of essential tremor, um, and Botox injections are a good way to treat them, but the Botox injections need to be repeated. The Botox wears off over time, and so they typically will inject, and then over time the tremor comes back, and then they get another injection every you know, six months or so, three to six months. So okay, one Linda. thing to mention here would be we still do the surgery for people with hand tremor. They may have additional benefit for voice tremor. So if someone has more disabling voice tremor and very little hand tremor, they may not be candidates for this procedure. Would they be a candidate for deep brain? No. The patient who is a candidate for focused ultrasound would also be a candidate for deep, deep brain. brain. Okay. Okay. Linda, who is watching on YouTube, wants to ask, is exoblate neuro used for familiar? I can't say that word. Familial. Thank you. Tremor. Familial. Yeah, tremor. Actually. I yeah. know what it means. I just have trouble saying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That inherited yes. stuff. Absolutely. It yeah. is. Okay. okay. And then just a couple of more. Oh, Joellen probably didn't hear, but does progression of essential tremor come on suddenly or progresses? Sounds like it comes on over a long period of time. Right, so it today. comes up slowly and it progresses slowly. If someone wakes up suddenly with a tremor, it may be that they had a stroke or something of that sort, it would not be essential tremor. Yeah, so if you have, if you wake up suddenly with a tremor, you need to go to the emergency room and be evaluated. That's correct. Much different, because if, if there is a stroke, we can intervene with that as well. So don't wake up, have a tremor, and then wait to get into the clinic. Okay, we have a COVID question that we're gonna kind of round out with. Joyce wants to know, if I take a statin, am I able to take PAC Paxlovid. Lovid. Yeah, I'd have to look at the uh, specific interactions with that. We know there's some interactions with, uh, with medications, particularly uh, medications that are metabolized through the liver. Um, just have to look exactly what that is. Obviously, for the statin, you can probably also uh, go off of that medication for that small amount of time. We know patients who are on immunosuppressives particularly have significant interactions. Um, so again, talk with your medical team, and I would have to kind of look at that uh, specific drug, just because we know so many people are on the statins, but I can try and get a quick answer for you for that one. Yeah, I think the statins you have to hold for a few days yeah. and take the back yeah. slow it. So, Which you know, I think is reasonable. It is, and you're not going to, there's not going to be a, a big problem as you held uh, your uh, statin drug for a day or two, because, or five, I mean, it, it um, and, and the, 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 the impact of Paxlovid is so great, it reduces the risk so far. I think it's clearly worth uh, holding a statin for a few days if we need to. All right, team, let's go talk a little bit about our final questions or final thoughts from this morning and from our guests. I'm going to start, uh, Dr. Chang, with you. Final thoughts for the day. Yeah, so final thoughts. Um, we're all very excited to be able to have Focus Ultrasound at KU. It's um, It's been with us for over a year now, but we're the only center in the region that offers this a treatment. Um, and I'm just excited that we're about to do our 100th case. Yeah, that's a very big <laughs> deal. Well, yeah. Congratulations and thanks for being down. We got to bring you back. And uh, I just have to say, Dr. Powell, with brilliant people like this coming to mind, it makes me feel better. I got somebody to help me when I get old, like you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll be getting old with you, though. <laughs> I know we are. That's a good thing. So final thoughts from today. So, you know, essential tremor can be disabling. It can really affect patients' lifestyle. We had deep brain stimulation that was approved over 25 years ago. And then after 20 years, we had focused ultrasound approved. The thing is we still need better medications because we would like to avoid any kind of surgery if we can help patients with medications. I can tell you in my last 30 years, this is the first time I have four clinical trials ongoing for essential tremor. And some of them are very promising. If you are interested in participating in it, email us at pdetcenter at kumc.edu 
or visit our website. Pretty good stuff. Doc, uh, Shirley, final thoughts? Well, you know, I have to say it's the best thing other than having my two daughters that I ever did. And I really think people should think about doing this. If you've gone over a long period of time and they keep giving you meds and they up it and it doesn't get any better, um, this is your option. Yeah, that is, you know, we really appreciate your coming on to give your testimonial today. You know, it's, it's stories like that that help us remember that science really matters. Science does deliver miracle cures or what feels like a miracle cure like this. You know, you I'm hear by the way. I'm an advocate for it, let me tell you. <laughs> and you've done a great job advocating it, so thank you. Because, you know, the truth is the truth, right? And, and when you see major advances like this that have changed someone's life and can make such a difference, you're just thankful people are out there studying and trying to find cures and trying to find ways to help take care of folks. Hawk, final thoughts? Yeah, you know, again, I think that's a great answer about, a uh, great question about the drug-drug interactions with Paxlovid. We know they have quite a few. You know, looking at the statins, it's different depending on what statin you're on. Uh, for a couple of them, they say, you know, hold the doses. Uh, don't be taking at least 12 hours before starting Paxlovid. When other, and some of the other statins uh, that are less potent, they say you don't need to temporarily discontinue. So I think talk with your uh, provider that is prescribing the Paxlovid and determining what uh, statin you're on for that. Um, but I think that's a great question because we know there is interactions with quite a few drugs with Paxlovid. So, but final thoughts, you know, Steve, um, what we do is, is not neuroscience and it's not brain surgery, obviously, like our very uh, esteemed colleagues here. Uh, we try to continue to endorse those simple messages. Those simple messages continue to be, please be up to date with vaccination, all of your vaccinations, whether it's Tdap, uh, shingles vaccine, especially the COVID-19 vaccines. And you can do those simple things now because we know it is going to be incumbent upon you as an individual to protect yourself, protect your bubble. Uh, now doing those things as we have seen a reduction in restrictions or total dissolution of restrictions and mandates, including mask mandates. Know the important things to do. Those are very simple. Wear your mask, do good, adequate hand hygiene, be outdoors, stay distance if you can. All of those things will help continue to protect you from COVID-19 and uh, the ramifications of that, especially hospitalization, severe disease, and death. We've talked before about faith, the intersection of faith, hope, and science during a pandemic or during any type of disease you have. What I know is this. Hope helps us get through the times to, while we have faith in science to help us get an answer. What you've heard today is a remarkable story, but it's true for so many different diseases that when we hang in there and we have hope for it getting better, then we can hope that COVID will end. We can hope that treatment will get better. We can hope that there will be a, a day when the pandemic doesn't try to have such an effect on our lives. It's not up to a federal judge to decide when and when it's not time to mask. That's up to your personal choice. And what you can do is continue to hope with all of us and just like Shirley, hope for a better day because science will help us and science has helped us. And real science delivers real treatment and sometimes it delivers real cures. That is what science does. And it is a remarkable story. And it's a great journey to live long enough, with Dr. Pawa and this young Dr. Brilliant Dr. Chang to watch people like that come in and help deliver hope for millions of people. Shirley, or Je sorry. <laughs> Jill, I'll get the names right. You want. Thank you, Dr. Steins. We really, it's been a great uh, program this morning. But before we let everybody go this morning, one real quick, important headline about what is happening on college campuses as a result of the pandemic. And joining us with some important information is Dr. Nawalnik, Greg Nawalnik. Hi, remember me? Yeah. Hello, <laughs> okay. buddy. I know. Uh, Justin and Alexis both were busy this morning. But, um, so the pandemic is making a mental health crisis on college campuses across the country worse. That's the headline. Um, how are students coping? Well, uh, in some ways, you could argue not not really as well as we'd hope. Um, and, and I think we're seeing the, the data tick in that direction. And, you know, when you think about going to college, um, you know, really ultimately so little of it is about the coursework and it's really a lot more about 
this kind of individuation experience and taking that next developmental step. And what we saw with the pandemic was uh, kind of a pullback of, you know, people that, that, you know, they get excited to look forward to going away to college and having a good time, meeting people, making friends, making memories for the rest of your life. And instead, for the last couple of years, people got messages of, hey, not so fast, just just settle in back at home and uh, log on. And, and when you think about when you attend a, a class, you attend the class, you sit through the lecture, and then afterwards you leave with all the other people in your class and you can kind of share the experience of, wow, that was rough or that was heavy, that was interesting, you know, and just have that kind of social interaction and to have that stripped, the pressure stayed, but then you had the isolation and uh, and also there were no parties, no good times, no new friends, um, just more of, you know, mom's grilled cheese or whatever, um, <laughs> which whatever. Uh, but the idea here is that there, there was definitely going to be an impact of this. And I think that then once there was the, the next year was kind of the, OK, we're going to go back to in person. And then again, you know, people got excited, ramped up, even went, moved in and then pulled back a second time. And the amount of frustration that's there, um, there's really not a lot of question as to why we're seeing these numbers and these increases in depression and anxiety, because it was very unsettling. And it really threw a, a wrench into an already challenging and complicated life step. And so, um, you know, I, and the other piece of this is when we see the data, there's also going to, I think it's, it's an underreporting because there are people who are just kind of white knuckling, but don't acknowledge and don't access care and aren't going to report their symptoms. And so they're still, just because they're not reported, not identified, doesn't mean they, they aren't struggling. They just might minimize what their actual struggle is. And if they actually spoke to a professional or actually engaged someone, they might realize, oh, I actually really am kind of in a bad way. Um, so that's that's what's been going on around all of that. That's kind of unsettling when you look at the stats that they went from 21 to 35 percent are saying that they are more depressed. So that that makes me feel a little bit personally uncomfortable. So what do we do ultimately? You, you, I know you got a patient that's waiting for you, but what is a piece of advice that you can give us to get engaged with these kids? Well, you know, I think it's it's number one. Uh, nothing changes in terms of, of the adaptive coping skills. There's not a different set for college students as opposed to the rest of, of adult world. Um, it really comes back to a lot of the same things of avoid isolation, even if you're not away at the big university and, and you know, going through rush, you can still inter interact with people. I mean, I think I've had patients who have struggled with this and I advise that, you know, while looking forward to getting back to in-person, you can actually send out an email blast to your, your class and offer a time for like a Zoom chat just to kind of get to know each other and be able to socially connect. Um, in addition to that, people primarily will already have their own uh, social support center, whether that's family, friends from high school, um, you know, and, and I think that we have to look at uh, maintaining that connection and really leaning on those things at these times. And, um, and, and also there's acceptance that this is hard. This is still, um, uh, it, it was already going to be a period of adjustment. This complicated, it made it much harder. So the more that we can actually identify with and own and accept that experience, the better we're going to be equipped to deal with it. And if you're noticing that none of this stuff helps, and I mean, the other part is don't try to self-medicate with alcohol or, or drugs, uh, you know, marijuana 420 today uh, does leap to mind. Um, you know, these are depressants that can actually wind up leading you to feel worse, uh, make it harder to find the adaptive things to do and the positives of your experience. And so we want to be aware of that. And also, you know, for family members um, of college students who might be struggling around this, just take keep keep an eye on them and, and just uh, be aware of variance from baseline. And if you're noticing that, you know, uh, maybe their favorite band is coming to town or something, and they just don't seem to care about that at all. Um, if they were formally engaged in any clubs or sports or activities, and now they just kind of don't want to do it. These are signs that something may be going you know, very wrong and it's good to reach out and give them the opportunity to talk about it. Sometimes it's just giving the words to it really does help to disarm some of this. You know, that last piece of advice is really good. If things aren't seeming just right or normal to uh, ask them questions, right? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. important to, to talk. Yep. All right. You are important too. Thank you so much for sticking out with us.
right? Oh, sure. It's always great. Go, go help your patient. Thanks. All right, thanks. All right, take care. Mother's Day is just about a month away, and we want to hear some of your ideas. There is a QR code on your screen right now where you can email us a short video with your favorite gift or what you're hoping for this year. You can also email us here at medicalnewsnetwork at kumc.edu. That address is on the screen. And if my husband and my daughter are watching, I want to eat grilled steak, play cornhole with the family, and I wouldn't turn down something sparkly. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget you can catch any of our shows anytime by logging on to our Facebook page, YouTube channel, and Twitter. And remember, we appreciate you. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for this best of morning medical update. You can catch our live broadcasts every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And don't forget, you can always email us at medicalnewsnetwork at kumc.edu or reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We will be back to our live shows five days a week starting September 6th. So please go out, make it a great day.